Hello everyone, welcome to today's show. And if you guys have noticed, we have changed our timing from 4.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Eastern. So from now on, we are going to be meeting at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's the time change. And if you're joining for the first time, we meet for the e-commerce topic as part of this series. And we bring one panel of experts uh, that is going to provide you compelling insights. And today's topic is going to be ICP. There are a lot of different interpretations, you know, if analysts have related to ICP. But here for this session, we are going to talk about ideal customer profile. So we are going to start with the intros. Eric, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Eric Landman with Earthling Interact. Interactive. I'm a project manager and e-commerce developer. I'm a Magento certified solution specialist. I've built about 50 plus e-commerce sites and quite a variety of platforms, including Magento and Shopify and OS Commerce and a bunch of other stuff. Um, my customers are about half business to consumer and about half B2B, business to business. Thank you so much for being here, Eric, and I think your background is going to be super important because uh, in both cases, whether you talk about PC or P2P, uh, identifying the ideal customer profile is going to be super critical overall for the e-commerce as well as uh, for the business model. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, Steve, can I move to you next? Would you like to introduce yourself? I'd love to. Yeah, I'm also going to apologize that my very large dog is drinking water behind me. <laughs> She's loud. <laughs> Uh, my name is Steve Rice. I, I'm uh, the founder of Dotcom Jungle and also the co-founder of the Globally Conscious Leader. And uh, at Dotcom Jungle, um, we also develop websites and uh, integrations. Uh, we mostly focus on helping uh, customers make and implement wise technology choices. Uh, and sometimes it does take the form of a website or, like I said, it, an integration. <clears throat> and, um, and the Globally Conscious Leader is a new project for me where we, we literally want to bring globally responsible uh, leadership ideas to uh, individual uh, C-suite executives and aspiring leaders. And we're bringing together actually some really interesting people from the specialty outdoor retail space as mentors in this. So I'm sort of leveraging relationships I've had in the outdoor retail industry, which will probably be connected to some of the things we talk about today as well. So thank you. And as we that. dive into that topic, Steve, I think we can talk about the ideal customer profile for globally conscious leaders. That will be a good exercise to find out, uh, you know, how to identify the ideal customer profile. So thank you so much for being here, Steve. Thank you. Okay, Damon, can I move to you next? Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, Sam. Well, I'm looking over here trying to get the live up here because I, I see in the comments, I don't know who's commenting, but uh, um, yeah, thanks. Damon Postalka, exit your way. What we do is we help owners create businesses that they can sell or succeed. So basically, if you uh, have a business and you really don't know what you're going to do with it for the long term, we help plan that out and get them get, help them reach their goals. And when you're working with those businesses, Damon, I can almost guarantee that when they don't know what they are going to do with their businesses, they probably don't know their ideal customer either. So that is correct. <laughs> it's going to be really interesting to dig into those stories. Thank you so much for being here, Damon. Chris, can I move to you next, if you don't mind? Yes, thank you, Sam. Chris Harrington, President and COO of Gen Alpha Technologies. We are a provider of e-commerce solutions for equipment and parts uh, manufacturers. So, so happy to be here. Looking forward to this discussion. I think ICP is super relevant for your space, uh, Chris, in the B2B. If you don't know your ideal customer profile, uh, I don't think the marketing is going to be effective. So thank you so much for being here, Chris. Absolutely. All right. So, Dave, I think hey. you are going to bring so many insights from the SEO and marketing automation perspective. That's why I wanted to keep you for last. So, OK, thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and thanks, everybody, for having me. Uh, BusyWeb is my agency. Been doing this for 22 years now. And we focus on the manufacturing and B2B services world where we help generate traffic, ideally transfer that traffic into real results and automate the interconnections to actually close deals and leads, which of course leads right back to your ICP, your ideal customer profile, AKA your buyer persona or your sales persona, 
we're going to talk a lot about this stuff. It's going to be super fun. Thanks. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Damon. So we are going to dig right into the topic. So we want to set the stage. Let's say if the listeners are not really familiar with what an ideal customer is, what an ideal customer profile is, and why that is going to be important. Uh, Damon, would you help me setting the stage in defining what an ideal customer is for a business? And if you have a story that you might be able to share, uh, you know, good versus bad ideal customer profile. I don't know if I've got the good versus bad, but, <laughs> but you know, your, your ideal customer profile is, is really who is the customer that if you could attract that one special person to buy from you, that is them. Um, and in the, it, it is amazing how easy it is to be wrong about that. And I think, I think a lot of, a lot of businesses miss it. And, and I have in our business even for a while. And, and when you go back and you look at your best customers and you really understand them well and talk to them, little simple thing like that, uh, they can tell you a lot about themselves and why they do business with you and what they like or don't like about what you're, what you do. And that's, that's really how you define it, but it is, it is who you want to sell to. Okay. Amazing. So I think you are absolutely right that, you know, I would probably think that, especially in the manufacturing community, uh, you know, 60 to 70% uh, manufacturers probably would struggle with this question. Uh, once they probably get on to their e-commerce journey, then they are going to probably be answering a lot of hard questions. And then they would probably know who their ideal customer profile is because for marketing, especially if you are doing paid marketing, it's going to be super critical. So Dave, I, I, I'm actually going to move to you next if you don't mind. So do you agree with the definition that uh, you know Damon has provided? Uh, would you add anything to, uh, to that in terms of identifying the ideal customer profile? I think with, with ICP's customer profiling, it's really important not only to identify who your favorites are, yeah. but also who your most profitable customers are yeah. and the space where you want to grow. And so the, the big points that we drive through for our customers, because that's actually the first thing that we do with all of our customers, we sit them down, we have a deep navel gazing session, and we look at what's really important as far as who your best customers are and what makes them tick. That not only comes from looking at who your favorites are, but looking at the data. And so what are your best traffic sources for your website, for your marketing, for your new deals, but also who are those most profitable ones? So you need to look at the entire universe of your buyer's journey and say, okay, for this many people or for this kind of person, they're more likely to make it all the way through. Or this kind of person is great up front, but they're only going to buy once and then they're never coming back. And so thinking about who that absolute best fit and probably having a few different ideal customer profiles for different stages of life and for different stages of growth for your company yep. is going to be very important. But the good news is, is that data is available for you to look at that. You just have to have your ERP, your CRM, your website, and your data analytics set up, and you need to know what to look at. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure. Okay, amazing. So I think you bring a very interesting point about the most favorite one. And I don't know how many companies really go for that. Maybe they do. Uh, but that's a very interesting point there. But I have one clarifying comment there. And I want to make sure that I am getting the uh, the um, the way you want, whatever you wanted to communicate, I'm getting that. So when you said most profitable, did you mean... The, the ones that are grossing the most revenue? Or did you mean more from the ROI perspective, more from the profit perspective? Do you want to clarify that? Probably most profit, but okay. you really need to think about, you know, because you can go with, you know, I can make 10,000 unit sales of this particular thing, but I'm only yep. going to make a buck off of each of those. Well, that's not probably all that great. If you can do the flip side and make 2,000 sales, but make 100 bucks per, that's a much better play. So you want to make sure that you're looking at what's best for your business and also sets you up for long-term sustainability. Yeah, love it. Um, so Eric, uh, do you wanna uh, define the ICP next? Do you agree 
with the definitions so far, do you have anything to add? Any examples? Uh, well, I, I guess I'd say that it's maybe not just one client profile. Uh, we have some customers, um, one that sells industrial equipment, that participates in several different markets, health clubs, hotels, uh, schools. So if you think about those three sorts of organizations, you have very different types of uh, prospective customers. For a school, it's going to be a purchasing agent or, uh, or a planner. For a health club, it's going to be an architect or a product specifier. So it becomes a pretty big challenge trying to construct a marketing message <clears throat> and landing pages and campaigns uh, for one type of customer because you don't have one type of customer. You've got three or four types of customers. And so, you, you know, if you really get into this, you've got to segment your marketing efforts and look at your reporting and determine what to do with each of those individual market segments. And of course, as Dave said, and I'm quite sure Christina would, or, or Chris would, would echo that, that's got to start with data. So you've got to know, uh, you know, who, who's buying what and how much, because usually your perception of this is wrong. <laughs> you know, you've got to look at the data and uh, see, uh, you know, what they're buying and when they're buying it too. Some of this may be seasonal. Uh, and of the time span of the purchases, because some of these organizations, as I mentioned, they might have a six month timeline on purchasing something. So just because they come to your site in January doesn't mean they're going to buy something in February. It's probably more like June. Uh, so you have to consider all of those, those sorts of parameters. Yeah, so some very interesting comments there. And even though uh, it's called ideal customer profile, I want to make sure that we are not only talking about the paying customer here because it could be also the ideal prospect profile and mm -hmm. they both would probably fall in the same category. So when you are defining them, they both are, even though you are calling them as ideal customer profile, uh, you know, they are meant to cover both the prospect as well as the customer. Uh, do you agree with me there or, or, or not, Eric? Uh, yeah, I do. In fact, we, we use a slightly different term yeah. when we're designing a site and building it out and working with the marketing team. We use the term personas, okay, uh, which is more of a, a personalized representation of what this person thinks and how they behave and how they, uh, you know, what, what their thought process is and how they would get to the site. That's how we perceive of uh, designing and building a site in terms of personas. It's, you know, it's just a nuance of the same concept. Yeah, so there is going to be a little bit of discussion there with respect to ICP. I mean, if we talk about the pure play marketing terminology, ICP, my understanding is that they like to think this as more of the account as opposed to the mm -hmm. person belonging to an account. So ICP is going to be the company your buyer persona is going to be the contact. That's my understanding. Uh, you guys probably can tell me, uh, you know, if that is not right. Uh, so buyer persona, uh, an account could have 50 different personas and they could have different needs. They could have different journeys overall from the customer journey perspective. Uh, you know, they may have completely different landing pages. Uh, okay, from the e-commerce perspective, they could have different pricing. Uh, <laughs> from the, I don't know if they are going to have different pricing. I, I, I really don't know. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Uh, there could be a possibility if they are uh, they have some sort of you know the corporate discount versus the the branch discount. I don't know. Uh, maybe Damon can tell me if that, that ever happens in the business. <laughs> uh, but they are definitely they have they have very different needs overall, right? So next, I am actually going to move to Steve. Steve, what are your thoughts so far? Do you agree with the definition? Do you disagree uh, with respect to ICP? Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I agree because I, I was about to add, sort of explain to you how I think about it and ask you if you thought that was correct. And, and I tend to think about it the way you mentioned, Sam. Yeah. Um, it, when I'm talking to my customers, and I don't have a lot of customers that do a lot of account-based marketing where a true company ICP is, is important, even though they have ICPs, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, but I, I do like to delineate that that uh, the ICP, from a semantic standpoint, we need to delineate the company from the people you're talking to. Yep. 
And so uh, that's the semantics I use is the ICP, the ideal customer profile. Is this company, what size are they? What industry are they in? Who do they serve? And, and the avatars or personas around which you might craft the customer journey that Eric was talking about. Uh, those are also the, the people that, and this is what I find most interesting. This is the human part of it. These are the people that you teach your salespeople, anyone who contacts the customers, yeah. you teach them how to talk to those people. And I'll give you a, a quick example is one of my clients I've had for like 23 years is one of the coolest drug education textbook companies in the world. In fact, it, it, the, the guy who writes the textbook for this was the founder of Haight-Ashbury Free Clinics or co-founder years ago. So he's been around for 50 years and this book is used at Harvard and Yale and whatnot. And, but they sell this book to students. They sell it to the bookstore buying agents who also get their information from the uh, professors who sometimes say, you need to buy this book. Sometimes they say, you need to buy this book to the professor because the administrator said they need to. Um, and then treatment professionals also buy the book so they can turn around, even though they had it in school, they turn around and use it to help people who are dealing with gambling and heroin and meth and all the addictions that you could possibly have. So, so a good example, their ICPs are basically universities that support some sort of drug treatment education programs and organizations, drug treatment organizations, whether they're public or private. And inside those, you have the university one's easy. You have administrators who uh, actually might hire Daryl, Anaba is the gentleman, to come speak at a conference or actually co-teach a class with the professor. And so they have a different persona than the professor. And you speak w way different to the professor, of course, than you would speak to the, um, the administrator. And the marketing is completely different too. The handouts are different. And imagine the students, you gotta get in touch with them in a completely different way. Uh, and luckily for them, once the students take the classes, uh, their persona becomes as a treatment professional. They already know who they are. They already have an opportunity to get back in touch with them. So I think that's a good example. And I. Would, I ask you is that the right way to go about it i i think so i think you are spot on to be honest and uh, just to translate that story in slightly more manufacturing situation uh, so in the manufacturing world let's say if you are trying to sell an equipment uh, to a large company and then you are going to be talking to let's say the technicians the operations folks the finance folks the supply chain folks they all are going to be using very different language, okay? They all are going to have very different interests and drivers. So if you are going to be using the same language that you would use for your CFO to your, let's say the sales guy, they're not gonna be excited. They, they will make sure they'll shut you down, right? Uh, if you do that. So you definitely need to make sure that you have the tailored messaging for each of those personas and those are going to be the buyer personas but you are absolutely right when you do the ideal customer profile uh, at that time you are looking at okay what is the amount of revenue what are the number of employees where they are located those are going to be the factors that are going to drive the overall uh you know marketing strategy for your ideal uh, customer profile i think chris is going to have a lot of insights there just because she has dealt with very large equipments and very large account and she has actually sold herself uh, so she's going to have very interesting insights in terms of how they do account mapping in your world uh chris yeah i think um you know it's interesting to listen to what everybody has shared here the the thing that i think we're missing so far is to remember the companies in your ideal customer profile are the companies that you bring the greatest value to so we have to remember to think about the customer as well. In our pursuit of being relentless, relentlessly focused on the customer, right? I mean, in order to do that, when we're profiling, we have to identify the pain points our, pro our products and services solve. And that becomes the market for our product. And it helps us identify the companies that can use our solution. So I think we really have to nail in on who gets the greatest value from what we can provide and what are their pain points. 
so we can deliver that marketing content and that other information and get all the value out of it that we intend to. So that that would be, um, you know, most of the businesses, frankly, that I work with, they know who they're selling to, but they don't they talk a lot about customers and customers who are manufacturers who talk a lot about their customers doesn't necessarily mean they have good focus on who their customers are and the problems that they're solving. Right. So by doing these exercises, you can align your organization around the, the, the communication and the problems that you solve so that when you're having discussions with clients, whoever they're meeting in your organization, there's a consistent level of understanding of what you do for them and how you can help them. So um, in addition to our goal for profits and revenues and everything else, we can't forget to in our ideal customer profile that we're really solving a problem for them in the end and who has the greatest need for the problem that we solve. Does that make sense? Yeah, so some very interesting comments here. And Chris, I mean, you are going to have two favorite plugs and one of which is going to be your data plug. And your second favorite is always like 80-20. And I yeah. think that's what you are talking about here. So yes. in this particular case, you are absolutely right that you need to, I know that, I mean, let's say if you have, I don't know, maybe 10,000 SKUs uh, and out of those 10,000 SKUs, only you have, five SKUs that are actually bringing the 80% of the revenue. And there are 10% customers that are actually bringing your 80% uh, of the revenue for you, probably ideal customer profile is going to be those customers that are really bringing the 80% of the revenue. Obviously the others are important as well, but they are going to have a lot more noise. So, you know, it is in your best effort to focus on those key customers and then whatever time and money you have left in the park, <laughs> then figure out for those 20 percent you got it and you know what's so beautiful about everything you just said is that e-commerce helps you with the other customers that are a little bit more uh administrative intensive have needs by having a self-service solution like e-commerce a place for them to go to get answers to their own questions alleviates your sales team from spending time with all the potential market of your business, but can help them focus on the ideal customer profile, but still have solutions for those outlying customers that maybe you still have our great product fit, but the consumption of time to get them to a yes uh, is a bit more challenging. E-commerce is a great fit for that space. So that's going to be a very interesting comment. And I am going to take uh, Dave's and Steve's advice, the people who are in the marketing spend space, okay? So the reason why I think that uh, you cannot simply rely on e-commerce for that 20% because you have to plan your marketing spend. And if you're going after everybody, then it's going to be really hard to plan that marketing spend. So Demon, I'm actually going to come back to you. Overall, let's say if we look at the e-commerce, in case of e-commerce, the ideal customer profile is going to be super important because let's say if I'm selling to five different industries and if I'm doing, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 campaigns and I'm trying to target everybody, I can almost guarantee that you are not going to get anywhere. And I think, you know, uh, you might remember this from our e-commerce conversation that you did mention that, you know what, when you start on the e-commerce journey, just try to, uh, you know, find that tiny bitty niche with respect to your product, with respect to your focus, try to see if you are being successful there and then replicate that success to, to other verticals. So in this particular case, let's say if you are e-commerce, would you suggest that, you know, go after everybody and design your marketing campaigns or would you focus on very narrow niche there and then, you know, figure out the ideal customer profile and then maybe try out the other ideal customer profile that you might have in your budget? No. <laughs> I'll just say it simply. It's a good way to waste money because because Google or Bing or whoever your spam is on, they'll take your money all day long. You can spend it the wrong way. But, uh, you know, there's there's people on here can answer this better than I can. But, you know, the approach that I've always seen that's been the most successful is you you really have to understand your ideal customer profile and then the messaging that's going to connect with them in any of these marketing campaigns. And it's not a one shot fits all by any means. You have to segment, like you said, the different 
ways and do it right. And I'll let Dave and Steve and, and the others talk about that. But, you know, from a, from a business standpoint, you should never just jump in both feet, you know, and, and really, really it is a try optimize, try optimize. And if there's yep. anything I've learned is that, you know, you can, you can jump into something and you'll pay two times what you get and you think you're getting decent return. But if you, if you really optimize and ramp into it, you can get twice the return uh, just by doing it right or doing it slowly and really learning along the way. That's, that's my input is take it slow and learn about it. Don't rush in. Yeah, so I definitely agree with everything that you said, uh, Damon, and I am actually going to ask uh, Dave on his opinion. So let's say I'm actually going back to what Chris has said, right? So let's say if I have, you know, $100,000 in my marketing budget, and out of that $100,000, I'm probably already spending $80,000, $90,000 on my 80% of the customer. These are large, big, giant customer. And obviously, they are going to suck a lot of my marketing budget because I need to produce case studies. I need to produce content so much, right? And now then I have the, the small uh, e-commerce customers left, right? So uh, in case of e-commerce, uh, how would you plan the conflicting priorities between your key customers versus your e-commerce customers? What approach would you take, Dave? So I think the important ap approach to take as you're trying to split the difference between the 80 and the 20 and realizing that you don't ever want to leave money on the table whenever possible, right? Unless it's the wrong money, right? So if you're losing money per transaction on those 20%, you should probably just let them go. But if you're trying to round out and or look toward the future, perhaps a little bit, then it does make sense to yeah. put some marketing into that other 20% or the other 80% that you want to focus on in reaching the, the right people. You know, you need to think about search engine optimization yeah. and you need to build a critical mass in order to get to the right people in the first place. And so, yes, you do need to have that activity but you do want to make sure that you're really measuring what you're getting and that you're always moving in the right direction because it's super easy to get caught up in tactics and say, oh, well, look it, we just we just made a click. We just got a thing. And yeah, that's that's great. But was it really a thing? Was it really a helpful output? And this is one of the things where, you know, especially a lot of manufacturers that have always just done great work and been rewarded with the business, but now the world is getting more complicated or more competitive. And so they're starting to actually have to fight for those dollars where they get hung up is they just shoot and figure, well, I know my customer. They've always been there. You know, the, these are the people that I'm working with. Like, yeah, but what's that, what's that next market? Or what about the fact that that huge multinational corporation just realized that your lunch looks mighty tasty and they want to come and eat it? And so you just need to build that and always be thinking about how you're reaching the critical mass on search engines and how you're reaching the critical mass on making sure that you've got a pipeline that you can continue to care and feed for and growing those lists and that engagement by just doing some of the right things. So I um, want to take one second. I know um, Eric raised his hand, so I want to give him the next the next bit. But um, shout out to Chuck Coxhead, friend of the show. Um, with limited resources, it's crucial to understand that ICP de defines those on whom you won't spend time. So yeah. you know, th this is this is a, a great point, and Chuck's always on on point on those things. So shout out and thank you for that distinction. Yeah, I just I had a question for you, Dave, because um, I'm curious about how this works, suppose you're, this example that you mentioned about a company who may be mature and has been around for quite a while, um, what what do they do? What sort of tax to tactics would they do to discover who their potential new um, target audience is or ICP? Mm -hmm. how, how would they learn that? Um, I don't, I'm not a marketing person, so I don't know these sure. things. Sure. I'm just curious. Uh, great question. And thank you. The biggest things that I normally do with our clients is we will run some research on what's happening and, and what we know. So you can do simple things. And if we're, if we're doing straight e-commerce, it's kind of easy. You can do a Facebook lookalike campaign, right. And see what pops up. There's a lot of data analytics 
organizations that you can tap into that can give you a lot of detail on who's thinking about you and, and what you're what you're looking at, even if you haven't looked at it. And then analytics will tell you quite a bit. And you know, this is one of the kind of sneaky ways to use Google Ads, you know, just running campaigns and seeing what define or or what, what where the easy money is, right? So where the easy clicks are. If you have different themes that you run and this one has 10 times the amount of interest as another theme or tactic or keyword, then you want to start balancing some of that in. And the ultimate goal of all advertising is to find high traffic, low competition, right? And so as we build that out, that's part of where you can find that and start to skate where the puck is going instead of always chasing after it on, this, on the ice. Okay, amazing guys. So I am going to have one more clarifying question for you, Dave. Um, mm -hmm. You know, especially around these conflicting priorities. And in my experience, I think ICP uh, does have a little bit of conflict there when you are competing in different industries, when you are competing for uh, you know different customers, and you have the the constant marketing budget here, right? Uh, and you have to decide, okay, which which are the ones that you want to go after. So when I think of the SEO, in my mind, SEO is more of the permanent real estate you know once you establish it's very hard to sort of change in case of ppc you can have the campaign you know you get the results you move on right it's it's very temporary so now when you are thinking of designing the seo versus ppc and thinking about your ideal customer profile so now going back to the same story where you were uh you know competing with your own marketing budget where you had your key customers 80 percent of the marketing budget and then you have these uh, these are smaller customers that is probably going to have 20% marketing budget. So in your experience, which one would you focus for SEO? Would you focus on the 80%? I think there's going to be a positioning that is going to be permanent overall. That cannot change, right? Obviously, you can have landing pages that you can have for different customer profiles, even in those. But there's going to be a bit of permanent position. So on that uh, permanent position, would you rather focus on 20% or would you focus on 80%? Well, it, it's kind of a two-parter and you have to go revenue versus traffic as yeah. well. Yeah. If you have keywords that you rank really well for, it's a whole lot easier to keep water coming out of a pump that's already been primed than it is to come up and start ranking from a keyword that you've never touched before. Yeah. So if you have a lot of traffic that's turning into a lot of business from ranking keywords, it absolutely makes sense to keep that up. The question that I get a lot from advertising versus SEO is, well, why wouldn't I just spend all of my money on ads and then the SEO will kind of take care of itself? Well, no, it, it absolutely doesn't. Yep. The way you want to approach advertising versus search engine optimization is advertising can help you identify the keywords that you want to rank for because it lets you do rapid fire you know, hypothesis and result. So you can figure out what are those keywords that you really do want to be ranking for. And then you take that content, those keywords, and you support it and start pushing yourself uphill by having a lot of really good, deep, rich content that's going to rank. But it's going to take like six months before any given keyword will really start moving the needle as far as moving up in rank. And you'll get an initial pop, but then it levels way out and you'll start seeing more benefit. But advertising is the way to figure out which way to go or read the barometer. And SEO is the underlying bed from which you can keep growing. This is why we do what we call growth-driven design with our clients. So we're always setting hypotheses with our customers and then adjusting and completing new tests to either help a page convert better or to better target our best customer or to get more traffic in. So you're looking at those at all levels. Okay, amazing insights. And Steve, I'm pretty sure you are going to have tons of comments because this is a conversation related to SEO versus PPC. Uh, so now when it comes to ICP, identifying the ICP, I think there are going to be different ICP uh, when it comes to the campaigns as well. So how would you approach this overall when you are splitting your marketing budget uh, across the campaigns and which are the ICPs that you are going to focus on? Um. 
I'm not sure I'm actually the most qualified person at this panel to answer that specific question simply because the types of customers I work with um, have ICPs. Okay. Um, and but they're they're not sophisticated enough pre-COVID to really understand what that ICP is, right? Yeah. And and so one I, I want to ask the panel a question and make a comment as an example of of how companies understanding of ICPs has changed because of the necessities brought upon by essentially the COVID. Um, and the result has been that what I mean by that is that like most of the companies that I work with, their ICP identification was basically taken care of by something called a trade show. So if you sold hooks and bullets and handguns and camo wear, you went to the shooting, hunting, and outdoor trade show in Vegas. Yeah. And when you had your booth there or you walked around, that's what you saw. Your All your ICPs are there, right? And if you're North Face and you need to sell to all the outdoor stores in the United States, you go to outdoor retailer and or your sales reps go to the, the regional sales rep association um, shows. And, they, they, and all the companies in the United States that have – you know, 20 to 30 or 40 year old buyers who are into the outdoors that want to buy coats for their store, they're already there. Um, and not only that, you probably are staffing that booth with the personas that are coming to that booth because it's a very persona driven industry. So now uh, this is the thing. Trade shows have gone away. So a lot of these folks are actually, they don't have the trade shows to go to. There's digital trade shows popping up. But I think what I'm seeing is they're being forced to actually reconsider what their ICPs are and how they might get to them. And I, I want to hear from everybody else what that looks like with the types of industries they work in. Because ours is fairly well defined. Bob's Bait and Tackle in New Fall, Alabama was a customer before COVID and, and after COVID, and it's still pretty easy to find them. You could look them up in the phone book even if you didn't have a trade show, sort of my point. Um, Whereas if you make, a, I don't know, roto-molded plastic doohickeys that go inside anything, how do you, you know, there's no trade show in Wuhan this year for all the Chinese companies that make roto-molded plastic doohickeys. So what do you do? Okay. Um, so does anybody want to take that question by any chance? Uh, anybody? Damon? Yeah, go ahead, please. I will on this because in the manufacturing world, it was it was like getting slapped with a dead fish in your face, man. Because, you know, it used to be that that um, the salespeople, there's you know, manufacturers were were have been very lucky for many years. And I'm not talking large many large OEMs. I'm talking a lot of the the smaller, you know, mom and pop kind of things. You know, sub fifty million. They've got salespeople running around. Those salespeople had relationships. They had and built those in, in these large companies. You know, I can be a, a perfectly good molar that's selling to a company like Polaris or something like that, and 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 doing really well, uh, and having several accounts like that. But now they and and that's the way they drove most of their revenue because one big account makes such a such a difference. But when you comes now and you look at the way that the the that has changed, their word of mouth advertising even is 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 getting hit because they can't. It's it's just you have to have so much better digital footprint right now for them to speak to that. They need to understand that ideal customer so much better because their website before could have been crap and they really didn't care because their salespeople would 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 find it and word of mouth, they've figured it out. But when that salesperson can't go out and build that relationship, boom, like that, they they really need to have that that ideal customer profile and speak to them with their digital digital assets so they do it. And that's the thing that I see more than anything is that everybody says, well, I, we, we get most of our business by word of mouth. Well, how much are you losing? Because people are, are so used to now, they, word of mouth is, hey, Damon just found out about this great company. I'm gonna go look them up online. If they look like a joke online, I'm done. Yep. That's the end of story. Yep. And and that's what people are realizing. I think that's that is in, in manufacturing is hitting people, like I said, like a dead fish in the face, man, because it's they their people can't just run free like they were before, uh, trying to find business everywhere. And it and it really hurt. Yeah, so some very interesting commentary there. It, does anybody have any other comments, thoughts uh, on this question? I am going to uh, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I would just uh, say that, you know, I think, Steve, your, your question is a really good one, because I also come from a world where most people think they know who their ICP is. Um, I, I will say that I, I don't I don't hear a lot of people talking about ICP, but I do hear people struggling with how to market today. Right. So they, they don't have the language for ICP. It might not have been part of their practice. So that makes this a very relevant discussion, but it's not something that uh, people naturally even know to think about because they felt for so many years that they already know that. And so does everybody else that's in business with them. So I think there's this reinvention of marketing that takes that's taking place. And probably this is a foundational element to that. So it could almost be a wake up call for people that, hey, maybe we need to go back to some of these basics so we can define this. So we do have better marketing content. So we are attracting the, the companies that we want to do business with. So our people are aligned in the right communication. But prior to that, they really thought they already knew this. So I think it's it's a new concept after COVID for companies. That's how I would answer it. I, I want to lean in just one one second on this too, because this is this is so fascinating, the the way things have just completely flipped. And for, for just anecdotally, I'll I'll let you know next week because I have my first show that I'm speaking at on Friday. And then I go right right away to Atlanta for a second show um, next week. So hopefully things are coming back and, and it's going to be interesting. But I think the, the big thing that came into focus for a lot of these businesses, um, especially in the B2B space, was they were trying to chop down trees with hammers before. And it just so happened that they had some weak trees. So they were smacking at it and the trees were falling down because the, they would go into target rich environments, right? So the trade show is a target rich environment if you're lucky. And they would have people there and they would, you know, shake hands and, uh, and hand out tchotchkes and business cards and stuff and, and magic sort of happened. The difference between that and where we're going and what really started to dawn on these businesses is that there are axes out there. There are ways that you can chop down trees in a single swoop. And for that, it's having better data on who those people are and a wider reach to reach a whole heck of a lot more of them virtually. Now, if you don't have a CRM to back that up, then you're in trouble. And where you could fake it before with trade shows is you would come back with 500 business cards and your sales team could call and kind of fake it and make it up. But imagine the difference between, especially for, you know, some of these shows are really expensive. So if you spend hundred grand on ads versus hundred grand on a trade show, your entire team is still in play that entire time. And you're probably going to wind up with 10,000 contacts of which probably 500 will be great instead of maybe a hundred cards that you would have picked up in the original show. And if I can add to that, I think um, what I'm finding is that my vendors are realizing that trade shows are a really great place to maintain relationships and not the best place to make new ones. And in the end, they're really not a profitable place to send their folks to. And, you know, like somebody said, gosh, you know, I had a had a great year. Um, we didn't send anybody to a trade show all of last year, you know, and, and they, this is a company with two different sales teams, we, one consumer, uh, one wholesale and actually a third industrial that sort of hits the same things. They didn't send anyone anywhere and they had a 55% a increase in revenue last year. So, um, the, the habits are changing, especially at that corporate level as people realize just because we did it all the time before doesn't mean we have to keep doing it. Right. So great points, guys. And I want to come back to uh, our discussion about ICP. So I agree with one point, Steve, uh, that you mentioned, and that is powerful in my opinion. Because traditionally, if you really think about how these ICPs were identified, and you didn't mention this, that they were driven by the trade shows. If you really think about it, building a community is extremely hard. So some of these trade show companies, they were doing the hard work of identifying these ICPs. And if you actually look at their collateral, okay, they had done all of this. And now you have to do their work. 
to be able to identify it. So you are absolutely right that the companies were created based on how trade shows had defined the ICP for each specific vertical. So let's say if you are selling to automotive, you are selling to aerospace, you are probably selling to oil and gas, uh, you are probably selling to you know some of these steel mills, and then you have those five industries that you are selling to, and you had four different ICPs because you are going to do four different trade show. Your marketing was you know ten thousand times four, forty thousand, and that's it. In <laughs> you had your numbers, but now in the digital world you have to define your icp so one strategy could be in identifying that is you can look at you know how trade shows were doing it and you can simply replicate that and i want to ask that this question to let's say dave if i actually followed this strategy i was going to four trade shows these trade shows are no longer here and now i am actually replicating the same effort same fund in my seo and ppc campaign would this work would it not work if it is not going to work, why it is not going to work? So the the answer, of course, is multi-part. But if you're trying to replicate a trade show, you're not going to be able to just start posting a bunch of content and have magic happen. You're going to need to do some laser targeting yep. on who you try to reach. That was the benefit of a trade show. Everybody was in the same room with you, right? And if you had the coolest giveaway, you were likely to get there, right? So you do need to target people and to find, this is where having an ICP, having a buyer persona that's a little bit more um, behavior based is definitely going to help because you can target with ads to drive people to a asset or something that's going to start a conversation. It's the same thing as the, the laser pointer that you were giving away or the cool bag or whatever, but it's, trading instead of a physical good, a knowledge piece that's going to spark a conversation. Now, the really cool part about that is that your user, the person that picks up your digital tchotchke, is going to be telling you what they're interested in by their usage or no or non-usage of that tool. And if you build it right, you can almost make it like a choose your own adventure, right? So you send them something really cool. They download that white paper or they answer that quiz or they, you know, get that book or whatever it is. And then you give them more on what you know your ICP needs to be successful. And if they take that bait, if they download that thing, then that's another decision tree. And if you do this right, your website and your marketing becomes that consistent, always on 24 seven consultative sales person. If you do it wrong and you're just spewing things out and hoping for the best, well, you're gonna get what you always got at trade shows, but virtually, right? So you're gonna get virtual crickets instead of just having a liver that, that hurts the next day. So, you know, that's, that's kind of my, my distinction. Okay, amazing guys. So I don't know if anybody has any follow-up comments there. Uh, I want to wait for just five seconds, if at all uh, anybody has. If not, then the next question I'm going I to think, have for uh, ahead, Sam, Chris, just to, just to add, I do think that there are outside of trade shows, there are places your ideal customers are hanging out. Yeah. You have to find those online. So the the it's happening virtually in a virtual world as well. So that you might not be in a physical space with them, but they're going somewhere to get information and they might not know to come to you yet for that, but you need to appear where they are hanging out. So identifying where they are, it, that's part of that research of, okay, first I identify my ideal customer profile and then I need to do the research of, okay, where are those people? Um, and once you figure that out, find a way to strategically be there uh, and then have your brand become known. Talk about the problems you solve, talk about the value that you bring. So virtually there's places people are going as well. That's what I would add. That, that's excellent, Chris. And the, the funnest part about that is that you get to add value in little ways. The, the lazy LinkedIn thing that I, that I hate so much and that we all probably get every week is, you know, people spot you and then they try to just dive bomb you and say, Hey, I, I sell crap. Would you like to buy my crap? And that's all I hear. Right. But if you're doing it lazy and you're just trying to puke all over them all the time, that's just going to shut them down faster. So it's an art form. And this is why you need to hire people that know what they're doing to engage people in conversation and to start 
wherever they're hanging out. So absolutely having the right places, but then not just barging into the room with a megaphone and saying, Hey, I buy, I have stuff come and buy my stuff is, is way less and way less fun for one, but way less effective than just being the, the company or the solution that always has the right answers and that people want to work with because you're solving for them. Awesome. Thanks. What I was going to add briefly, uh, Sam and Dave on, onto yours and to Chris, is that if you think about how much money you spend going to trade shows, that, that's basically a lot of opportunity cost in price, the, what you spend in expenses that could be spent on human beings as well as trade shows and advertising. And if you, you think about how much time those people spend standing at those trade shows and not, you know, they're effective there, but if they took that time, all those people, plus all the, the cost it took to, to, to buy the, the booth and transport it and take it down and rent the space, you know, sometimes it's, it's $75,000 to be at a show or more, uh, way more actually. So yeah, way more. if you spent that on human resources, it, it just irrespective of what you spent on advertising, you could have a major impact on the relationships you have in the community just by getting people, you know, cold calling, um, or, or at least some mechanism in which human beings are touching other human beings. And still save a lot of money. <laughs> Amazing, guys. So I wanted to cover one question, uh, you know, which is always confusing for a lot of people when they are designing their either the digital presence for first time, e-commerce site for the first time. And in my experience, ICP typically has deeper implications. OK, so if you go to your website guide, they are going to have questions such as, OK, which is the customer or the industry you want to have at the first place? or the second place, or the third place, okay? Which is the page that you want as the first option when you are, when the visitors are actually coming to your homepage, okay? So now, if you are going to be focusing on ICP number one, ICP number two, ICP number three, I think there is some sense of priority when you are serving multiple industries, multiple customers. So how do you decide between which is going to be your ICP number one, ICP number two, assuming that we have all agreed that every business is going to have multiple ICPs. So how do you decide on the priorities? Uh, do you want to take this, Damon? I'm, I'm probably not the most qualified to it. I, I, I tell you from seeing what some what other people have done, though, a lot of times there's underlying things that you can you can do on, say, a home page that that will engage your your overall icp pretty well and then allow them to get really quickly into what they want but you know other people on here can answer this a lot better than i can okay dave do you want to take that sure let the data talk to you and put you know work against this in hubspot for example which is the tool that i use for my for my crm it's tied in marketing and i know how well each of the personas is performing and so if I know that every time I publish for customer profile X, I'm two times more likely to get a conversion, well, there's my number one, yeah. right? But you also need to think about all of the other things that you can use to get that barometer, that it might be click-throughs on ads, it might be what you can get for free just by looking at Google Analytics or Google Trends to see what the hottest topics are, and if you know down to you know the the most basic level who that kind of person is and what that kind of company is for an icp and if you know that this is what makes that group tick these are where the easy dollars are this is what's going to convert easiest you have to balance between ease of use and most profit right and chris is already raising her hand okay yeah, well, I would I would just add to make sure that you look at your existing customer base, right? So not just what the data that you're, you're, you're trying to attract people, but you have an existing customer base. Many people do, and there's a lot of data on them, right? So you've got your lifetime customer value. You understand um, the ones that are giving you the repeat business. You know, the ones who have been loyal to you, what is common about them let that be part of the definition that helps you prioritize the ideal customer profile so look at your existing customer base there's a ton of information in there as well i completely agree 
Go ahead. I have kind of an interesting example it, that doesn't it closely speaks to this. In, in the music industry, uh, we work with a company that makes high-end music industry cables. So you've got speaker cables, guitar cables, microphone cables, et cetera, right? And in this particular instance, the, the manufacturer really has one ICP, and it's stores that sell musical instruments. You know, maybe they're going to sell institutionally to universities that have music programs, but probably not, right? Mostly they're selling. If they're doing that, they're doing it through Hal Leonard as a distributor. Their website, speaking to what Dave's talking about, their website is actually, should be, and will be, oriented around the avatars of the people that buy. And the, the musicians that are using those essentially are buying them for three purposes. So they're, they're either practicing at home, they're on stage, or they're in a studio. There aren't huge categories of places unless somebody's uh, doing rock and roll uh, concerts underwater and that I don't know about. That's what they, so that when you when you go to the, this uh, musical instrument cable website, you need to speak to those people and you also have to have sort of the good, better, best story going in order to make it all make sense. But from, from the ICP standpoint of the manufacturer, the identification of those avatars and those places, the uses of those, is actually the marketing piece that sells to their ICP because their ICP understands who they're selling to and now they know how to buy it because they, they know what it's supposed to look like on their rack because it looks correct on the website and they're not confused like, should I be buying you know cable A, B, or C? So um, in this case, it's not one where, where you have to judge and, and choose which ICP, but they have to actually manage each of the individual avatars under that ICP, even, the, even though the people that are the object of that avatar are can buy from this website and aren't the object of the ICP. Does that make sense? So it's, a, it's an interesting twist on the ICP avatar relationship. That, that makes sense completely though, because there's a lot of industries like that where you have to help your, your customer be successful with their customers. Uh, Chris, you're in that kind of business. You know, you've got to make your customers successful. Those OEMs selling to their distributors and their end customers. It, 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 it's, it's, yeah. but that's a great example. Yep. I like it too. All right, guys. So we are close to, close to our time now the only thing we can take right now is the closing advice sorry guys you guys must have uh, you know meetings to go so we want to be respectful of everybody's time um so eric i'm actually going to start with you do you have closing advice um not really advice i'm i'm not a marketing person but it's been interesting hearing all these nuances to these things so it will help me with building out sites for my customers who are marketing types Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, Dave, your closing advice, please. You really need to take the advice of experts in this space. You've got six of them here. And so, you know, by, by all means, if you have follow-up questions or things, we'd all love to chat with you and answer those for you. The, the goal of having an ICP, having a persona, is to be as useful as possible to the people that matter most. So if you're not being useful to those people, you're missing out on business and make sure that you're taking the time to really get to the heart of who you're trying to serve and what success looks like for them. Okay, amazing, love it. And guys, we are probably not going to have time for this question. So if you guys uh, can comment later on, uh, we'll definitely appreciate that. So Steve, I'm actually gonna move to you for your closing advice, please. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on and support something Dave said earlier. Uh, recognize that paid advertising is the number one fastest and most economical and efficient way that you can do R&D for your marketing team. You know, you, you basically, you can run things there and learn about SEO. You can learn about your, your products. You can actually answer part of that question that's being asked below about social listening and building insights about your products. You can pay for that. You can get it fast, and it's highly accurate. Completely agree. Thank you so much, Steve. Okay, uh, Chris, your closing advice. Yeah, I would just say, make sure you do the work of identifying your ICP uh, because it does give you a better return on your marketing efforts. So uh, by getting that relentless focus on who it is you're trying to attract, 
you're going to have greater focus in your content and you're also going to have better alignment internally in your organization. So do the exercise. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, Damon, your closing advice, please. Well, I think, uh, I'm just going to echo some of the, the things that I've said, but one of them is this is something that you need to use professionals for. I mean, I, I don't try to do this on my own. It's just not something you can do, especially when you're going to do what Dave is talking about with understanding the data and, and doing it right. And, and don't think that you can turn this over to um, some, you know, new college graduate or something like that. Nothing against it, but it's, it's, it's something that it's, it, this is difficult stuff. And, you really take the time to find the right people to help you with it because you can waste a ton of money really fast. Yeah, completely agree. This is going to be really foundation of your entire business in my mind. That's the foundation of business model. So thank you so much, Dave, for that insight. Guys, uh, you know, I just want to thank you, everybody, for their time and insights. I know you I guys. I want to interrupt you and ask you what your advice is, Sam. Then you can sign off. So my advice is going to be, listen to this show. The amount of insight that we have as part of the show, I think that is just phenomenal. This is just free advice. A lot of people can learn a lot from this. So thank you so much, Steve. Again, uh, you know, guys, if you are joining for the first time, we meet every Wednesday from now on at 5.30 p.m., not at 4.30 p.m. So don't miss next week's show. On that note, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.